Six Dots, a story of young Louis Braille, by Jen Bryant, illustrations by Boris Kulikov. Let's see what this book is all about. One day I was born. Papa announced me to the village. Here's my son, Lowy. The neighbors came, clucking their tongues, whispering, Too small. He won't survive. Oh, but I did survive. I was a curious child. My eyes studied everything. Mama's gentle face lay straight in my cradle, the smooth shape of a bread loaf on the table. I grew strong and healthy. When I rode to the bakers on my brother's broad shoulders or fed the chickens with my sisters, the villagers waved and smiled. So handsome, they cried. And clever, too, my sister said. At three, I knew everyone in Copre by name. I counted the eggs in my sister's basket and the sparrows in the trees. I repeated stories I heard word for word. But what I loved most was to watch Papa work. People came from far away to have a harness made or a broken brittle mended. In Papa's hands, the rough leather strips became smooth and useful. I wanted to be just like him, but when I reached for a tool, don't touch that, Papa warned. Then more gently, you're too small yet, Louis. Wait till you're older. Too small, those words. I wanted to be bigger, stronger, older. Perhaps if I show Papa what I could do. The letter was smooth. The owl was sharp. I knew just how to. Papa, Papa. My life changed that day. A healer bandaged my eye. Again I heard, no touch pass, don't touch. But the bandage itched so much. My hands, like the sparrows in the trees, were small and quick. I couldn't keep them away. I didn't mean to make things worse, but I did. The infection spread to my other eye until I could see nothing at all. No trees or sparrows, no faces, no lace or loaves of bread. By the time I turned five, I was completely blind. The villagers whispered, poor Louis Braille, such a clever boy. What will happen to him now? My world was dark and dangerous. I stumbled about the house, banging into the shears, the walls, the door. My body ached. Where is the sun? I cried. But the sun did not come. I sat by the window training my ears to do what my eyes could not. Clang, clish, kish, that was Papa in the his shop. Swish, 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 swish. Long, scary ladies hurrying to market. Clump, 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 soldiers marching down the street. Grrr, rough. The neighbor's angry dog, chained too tight, alone in the dark. I knew just how he felt. My family did what they could. Papa made a wooden cane. Each day I walk a little farther, tap, 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 counting the steps between the houses and the garden, the vineyard and the chicken coop, the bakers and the millers, and back to Papa's shop. My brother taught me to whistle, bree, ree, ree, and when the sound echoed back, it warned me of things in my path. My sisters made a straw alphabet, Papa made letters with letter strips or by pounding round-topped nails into the boards. With my man, I played dominoes, counting the dots with my fingers. The village priest taught me to recognize trees by their touch, flowers by their scent, and birds by their song. I listened closely as he read to me from the Bible and from books of poetry. Do you have books for blind children, I asked. No, Louis, the priest replied. I'm sorry. When I was older, I went to school with the other village children all day as they wrote down words and numbers or read out loud from printed pages. I sat in the front row, listening and memorizing. Do you have books for blind children? He asked again. No, Louis, the teacher replied. I'm sorry, but I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. I just wanted to read and to write on my own, like everyone else. The Marquise, a noble lady living nearby, heard about me. 
She wrote a letter to the Royal School for the Blind, asking if I could study there. Finally, a reply came. Bienvenue. Welcome, Louis. The priestess they have books for the blind. I told Papa excitedly. But you're only ten, Mama cried. And you live there most of the year, my brother added. How could I make them understand without books? I will always be poor Louis Braille. I will always be held back like that dog chain too tight. I love you, I told them, but I must go. I didn't need my eyes to know that the royal school in Paris was not a palace. My hard bed was in a damp, crowded room. My uniform itched. My meals were small and cold. The teachers were strict. The older boys teased and stole how I missed my home. And yet, I stayed. I stayed because somewhere in this old, moldy building, there were books for the blind. Only the best students are allowed to read them, my friend Graville told me. Then I will be one of the best, I replied. Learning at the blind school was almost like learning in Copbray. We sat and listened. We memorized and recited. We almost had music lessons and made slippers in the workshop. As my fingers flew across the organ keys or between the strip of cloth, I dreamed of reading and writing. I worked and studied as hard as I could finally. It was that day. A guy led me to the library. I said, yes, but you see, sit there, he commanded. There was shuffling, grunting, and scraping. I thought, voila, there it is, he said. You straight the raised letters with your fingers. It was a long reach to the top of page one. My fingers traced the outline of each letter, just as I'd done in cup ray, with the straw and leather. But these waxy letters were huge. After reading the first sentence this way, my hand was halfway down the page. A few sentences more, and I had turned the page. A few more sentences, two more pages, and then the end. Shesh too, is that all? I asked. There are more, the guy replied. But they're just like this one. Words as large as my hand. Sentences that took up half a page. I sigh. Even if I read a hundred books like this, how much could I learn? I skipped supper. I laid in bed, wishing I was home. When I finally fell asleep, I dreamed that the neighbor's angry dog broke free. He ran to me, licking my face until I laughed and laughed. Louis, Louis, Levato, get up. Gabriel shook me awake. It was morning. The headmaster wants us. Let's go, Alonso. Everyone had gathered in the big room. The Pigmeer spoke. A French army captain has invented a code to send secret messages during battle. The code is read by touch, not by sight, so we might use it here too. You're each holding a message written with patterns of dots. The headmaster continued. Each pattern stands for a sound such as out or in or sh. We listened as he explained. It wasn't easy. There was a lot to remember. Flipping my paper over, I moved my fingers from left to right. Feeling the dots fall back, I shouted. Everyone laughed. It was a battle order, of course. But now my heart pounded with hope. I asked for another. Again, I touched the dots. Supplies arrive at dawn. We, oui, yes, the headmaster cried. The other shouted out their messages too. How are the messages written? I asked. The headmaster handed me a slate, a wooden frame with a metal piece. In the middle, slide your paper underneath, he explained. Now take this stylus, but be careful. The sharp tool was like the awl in Papa's shop. I shivered. Use it to punch the code into the paper, he said. I made a few of the complicated dots patterns, then flipped the paper to read them by touch. For many weeks, I practiced reading by touch using that as a brilliant idea, at least on the battlefield, but for us, the code was so hard that everyone else in the school had given up. 
Even a short message takes so many dots, and I can't fit a single symbol under my finger. I complain to Gabriel. Plus, the captain's code stands for sounds, not for letters. So what, my friend replied. So why shouldn't we spell words and write sentences like sighted people do, I argued. This code was a start, but it wasn't nearly good enough. We blind, we're still held back. Will the captain work on improving it with me? I asked the headmaster. I'm sorry, Luis. He is interested, he replied. Sorry, that word. Long ago, I had watched Papa take rough letter strips and make them useful. Now I knew what I had to do. Late at night, while the others slept, I bent over my slate and punched the pages. I tried hundreds of ways to simplify the captain's code. I worked until my back was stiff and my fingers ached. Often I fell asleep a few minutes before morning. A year passed, then another and another. That winter I turned 15. I was often sick, but I wouldn't rest. Finally, it was ready to test. I asked the headmaster to choose something from his own library, a book. I never heard of before. Please, read it out loud, I said. Dr. Pignier began. After a few minutes, I interrupted. You can go much faster, sir. As he read, I copied down the words, spelling each one correctly. My new code used just six dots, arranged into two columns, like dominoes. Each dot pattern stood for a letter of the alphabet. Finish, said Dr. Pinier when he reached the end of the chapter one. Finish. I turned my pages over, reading by touch. I recited the entire chapter. Luis, to last fate, you did it, he shouted. Word spread quickly. The other students rushed to try it. Si facile, so easy. Et si vet. And so fast, we can read words and write letters like everyone else. As my friends traded messages, I remember watching Papa in his shop, bent over rough strips of leather, making them useful. I had become like him after all. More about Braille. Why was Louis' invention of Braille so important? Helen Keller compared Braille to Gutenberg, the inventor of the printing press. And that, my friends, was the end of a beautiful story. I'll see you next time. Bye.